so what have you been reading, Lucky? I've been reading a fantastic uh, new debut novel by a Sudanese Australian author. It's called Beneath the Darkening Sky by um, uh, a young man called Majok Tolba. Its 11 year old narrator, Obina, is in his village one night when rebel soldiers come to the village and um, start burning, uh, burning the huts down and they, they line up all the children um, against uh, an AK-47 machine gun and all the children who are smaller than the machine gun get to stay. Anyone who is taller than the machine gun gets uh, put into a truck and taken away and forced to become a child soldier. As I understand it, um, Majok, uh, this actually happened to him um, as a boy. Uh, his brother was was taller than the uh, than the AK-47. Got taken away. Majok, thankfully, was 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 wasn't tall enough and didn't. So the young young narrator, he slowly changed from an innocent young boy into well, almost into this kind of killing machine. Uh, it's hard to recommend because it's an ordeal to read. Um, no. what, do, what do you guys think? I mean... I found this book. Majok Talba came to me through a friend. He's actually 27. He came to this country as a refugee when he was 16. He had no language other than speaking Dinka, his own language. Yeah. Couldn't read and write anything. Mm. This manuscript landed on my desk. I sat on it for a couple of weeks, mm. finally picked it up and read it one Sunday, and it moved me to my court. Yes, the violence was overwhelming. I mean, at times yeah. I had to it's, get up yeah. and walk away from it's, it. That's what However, I, I, life exists in these atrocities. Look, I found it graphic, I found it brutal, mm. I yeah. found it moving, I found it shocking, despite it being powerful. There are other stories that sort of have pulled me more in, and I think it's that very tricky thing with such horror to make the beauty. If we sort of say this is a debut literary fiction, wow, Listen, what a debut. Uh, no question. No question yeah, about yeah. that. I finished it a little while ago and I, I have been thinking about it. It, is it doesn't leave you. It does not leave you. It does not leave you. And it yeah. will make a mark. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, on a lighter note, we recently caught up with some authors at the Sydney Writers' Festival and asked them when and where they read. To me, hell would be to be trapped somewhere without anything to read. And it can be anything. I mean, I have been known in motel rooms. I've read the, the toothpaste packet and the, you know, instructions on the back of the door about what to do in the case of fire. Most of the reading I do is very early in the morning in the kitchen of my house in Dublin. I have a old, lovely old armchair that we found in a skip, uh, which seems to have magical properties. So I, I lurk in there. Or the other place I read, of course, is beside my lovely wife in bed at night uh, before we pass out after the three children. And what have you been reading this week? I've been re reading popular science. In fact, this book is in the tradition of uh, the books like Salt and Cod. Floating Gold, The Search for Ambergris, the Most Elusive Natural Substance in the World by Christopher Kemp. Now, Christopher Kemp is a molecular biologist, American, and he spent a couple of years in New Zealand. And shortly after he got there, there was this large lump of stuff washed up on a beach. Stuff. Of stuff. They didn't know what it was. And there was a lot of speculation that this was ambergris. Now, what is ambergris? Ambergris is a secretion that's formed in the intestine of a sperm whale, but not all sperm whales, only about sort of 1% of sperm whales. And it ranges in size from a small pebble to a large boulder. What happens is that this usually gets kind of washed up after the whale dies on beaches. There's a huge amount of mystery surrounding this substance. For a long time, they didn't know what it was. But why it's so sought after, why it's so rare, why it's so expensive, is that it formed the basis of a lot of um, perfumes. It was burnt as incense, it was used as aphrodisiac. Mm -hmm. And you can't manufacture it. And you cannot manufacture it. And you can't it. predict where you'll find it. No, no. And it's almost as expensive as gold. And in, at times, much more expensive. Oh, wow. So this, this is his obsession to try and find out about ambergris, because not much is known about it. And it is a fascinating journey. A couple of reservations. I just wished at times that it was kind of better edited, you know, mm. just a little mm. bit tighter. Well, I mean, you could actually tell that he was a scientist rather mm. than a writer, I felt, um, mm. in the style of writing. I mean, mm. I did find it interesting, though. Yeah, the characters are really fascinating. You've got a story there of somebody diving in into the carcass yeah. of an eight-ton whale into the... Uh, <laughs> to actually pull and stuff Through out. the guts. Oh, no. Yeah, and this stuff sort of, you know, each one, depending on its maturity, smells different, you know, anywhere yeah. sort of from freshly cut... Uh, 
the grass, mm. through to fresh dung, mm. through sort of uh, floral scents. Mm. There's a description of sort of smells like a sunset, you know. I like this kind of this kind of science. The first thing of, of this type that I read was um, uh, was the perfect storm, Sebastian oh, Newman's yes. book, which was um, you know, fantastic. Mm. I think it's accessible. It's perfectly readable. You know, I mean, I didn't love it, but it, it was lovely, and I learned a lot. It was nice. Yeah, yeah and in, yeah. in its genre, a fine example, mm. and yeah, into mm. a world that I never knew about. Mm. Yeah. I think life's too short to finish books. You uh, you know, you're not enjoying. You should try to be very careful with the way you deal with it and then re-gift it. <laughs> it's the predictable, the boring, the kind of painting by numbers. They're the books I close. The book I'm most guilty about not finishing because my, my close friend, Colm Tobin, is a great fan of Henry James. And I've actually never confessed to him that I haven't read Portrait of a Lady. I have Portrait of a Lady, which isn't quite the same thing as reading it, I know, but I do have it. And you know, before I go, maybe I will read it. But, uh, and it isn't because it's a bad book, it's because I'm a bad reader. And that was Sebastian Barry on his unfinished Henry James. Now, well, I did finish this. I just read The Age of Miracles by Karen Thompson Walker debut fiction novel. It was reminiscent for me of Audrey Neffenegger's Time Traveller's Wife, mm -hmm. uh, where you have what appears to be a sci-fi book, but it's not sci-fi at all. Time actually gets slower. We don't know why this is happening and why the world has slowed down, so we start to see the sun rising at, say, 3am and setting at 3pm. I feel that it's a coming-of-age story yeah. about this, this beautiful character called Julia. So she's retelling what's happening when she was younger. So firstly, mm. you know that she's actually survived it, so mm. it wasn't catastrophic in a sense. Yeah. Some really beautiful observations and storytelling about relationships, you know, about her relationship with Seth, about her parents' relationship. Mm. I like this book. I like it a lot. I think it's a great debut novel. I think it's going to do really well. The premise is fantastic. The, yeah. the, the world starts spinning a little bit slower, so each day becomes comes several minutes and then it's hours longer and, and stuff, longer yeah. and longer yeah. and some people um, stay on clock time living you know mm. 24 mm. hours to 24 hours others <clears throat> become real timers and so their days stretch longer and longer and so society becomes divided you never find out why why the world started but do uh, we you know, need slowing to know down that? you it's never fiction. know you mm. never find out why and how she survived I got to the end and went you didn't tell me what was yeah. going on. It, it didn't resolve. It didn't, and I found it unsatisfying too. There should have been a small band of scientists. Hello, when you know, we were the time traveller's yes, wife, we didn't know why they were time travelling. We just knew that it was a story of love and romance. Yes. I mean, you guys had to just put the sci fi aside. No, 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 We weren't. I wanted actually greater complexity. It made me angry that I had invested so much time in it. Well, I actually enjoyed the time that I invested in it. I thought it was a great day. Novel. It was, yes. And, and I highly recommend it, and I'm glad you boys finished it. I always finish them. Uh, what do you say? I used to sneakily read Wilbur Smith's novel. Oh, that's easy, John Le Carre. I like um, zombies and vampires. Never feel guilty about something that you enjoy reading. The divide that we set up between the literary and the popular is, uh, is, an, is as arbitrary as the wall that divided the people of Berlin. I agree. I have no guilty pleasures. Pulp is pure pleasure. <laughs> I might feel guilty about reading Matthew Riley, but I just love him. <laughs> and I, for that kind of pleasure, I, I kind of go to television. Yeah. West Wing, you know, that's, that's my pleasure. And guilty pleasures in all their forms are pleasures. Mm. I've got some treasures as well. <laughs> <laughs> the Wolf and the Watchman um, by Scott Johnson. This child discovers that his father is a CIA ag agent. True story. This is a fiction novel, The Year of the Gadfly by Jennifer Miller. Um, again, in probably Donna Tartt, The Secret History. Uh, yes. That's what Good read. Yeah, yeah. And a memoir, Jasmine and Fire by Salma abdul Noor, set in Beirut. Um, oh, food, yes. love, yeah. gorgeous. Read it. Now I know we might not always agree, but until next time, I'll think about it, Cheryl. <laughs> Wouldn't miss it for anything.